Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, and for those of you who wake up early enough, uh, CNBC and NBC, uh, it is my privilege and pleasure uh, to be here today uh, with Mike Hayden, uh, who's the former director of the NSA, former director of the CIA, uh, to talk about, I think, an aptly titled topic, which is the future of liberty, right? Um, and I want to I want to quote your friend uh, Ed Snowden, um, who said recently. He said, "I would say that the last year has been a reminder that democracy may die behind closed doors. We don't have to give up privacy to have good government, and we don't have to give up liberty to have security." When you think about the next ten years, put us out in two thousand. Mm -hmm. Uh, 24, if you will, what does our liberty, everybody in this room and the public's liberty actually look like relative to what you used to do? Yeah. So first thing I'll do in answer to the question is that you can't discuss liberty in isolation. If you go back to the foundation documents, you know, we're doing this whole thing here with the business of government for three objectives, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. And government exists among men for those three functions. I remember reading that. And what we have to do as a free people is to balance those three very important functions in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so, and so this, this whole question of, of liberty is a continuous negotiation for a free people. Put another way, it, it's a negotiation between yourself as a a unique creature of God, and yourself by nature as a social animal. And the trick is, how do you balance that duality in, in our very existence? The things that are precious to us and must be, must be kept to and by us, that's liberty. But there's also the question of ourselves as a social animal. What of our personal self must we give up in order to live in an organized society. You negotiate that all the time. And we're now involved in a really big negotiation about that. And that really big negotiation, I think, has been forced by three issues. One's a cultural shift, OK? To go to the millennial you quoted, all right? The millennial. He, um, <laughs> you, you won't refer to him by name. <laughs> Actually, at NSA, he is referred to as the one who will not be named. True story. Um, if, if, if you go to what he just said about government secrecy and so on, let's take the program that he revealed that's gotten the most traction because it's the one that most involves you and me. It's called the metadata program, the 215 program. It's the one that's got all your phone bills sitting somewhere in eastern Maryland mm -hmm. along with your phone bills yep. and, and, and my phone bills. Um, that may make you nervous. I got that. That's, that's fine. That, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the process. All right? That program has been approved by two presidents. I should add, somewhat different presidents. It has been legislated by both branches of Congress, by bipartisan majorities, and reauthorized. And it's overseen by the federal court system in the FISA court. If Jimmy Madison were here, He'd call that the Federalist trifecta. You have all three co-equal and competing branches of government going, check, check, check. The cultural shift that he reflects, doesn't create, is that there are an awful lot of folks, kind of in your generation, mm -hmm. that says what I just described for you no longer constitutes consent of the governed. Because, all right, you told all those mopes, but you didn't tell me. That's a very different formula for representative democracy. And, and, and so what we're seeing in Snowden is important enough, but Lord knows important enough in my old world, but it's a really big deal on how we actually decide as a people to, to create consent of the governed. So the first change is cultural. The second change is technological. You know, you can do a lot more with metadata than you could at the time of Smith versus Maryland in 1979, a five to three court decision that said metadata is not constitutionally protected. And then the third change is the change in the nature of the threat, which has eroded 
the old distinction we as Americans used to fall back on to keep ourselves safe and free, the old distinction was, I want my intelligence over here, and I want my cops over here. Mm -hmm. All right. I want my foreign work done under one set of rules, and I want my domestic work done under another set of rules. And what you've got in the 21st century is a convergence of foreign and domestic law enforcement and intelligence that makes those old distinctions almost meaningless. And so we're, we're trying to work our way through to the new meaning. Sorry, this is a long answer. I'm going to give you one more, one more point. Please. For most of the American Republic's history, our security establishment has been designed to protect us against malice emanating from nation states. That is no longer the primary threat to your well-being. The primary threat to your well-being right now, I give speeches, that we were talking about that before, Andrew. The question is, what keeps you awake at night? And I've had a list of five things. Three of the five aren't nation states. Terrorism, transnational crime, and cyber activity. Right? In fact, they're not the product of nation state power. They're the byproduct of nation state weakness. And so we've got an entirely new vector of threat. Now, let me round this out, all right? This president says we're at war with Al Qaeda. All right, so did President Bush, but this one continues to validate that. So let me give you three examples to give you why, the, why we have this issue, okay? We're at war with Al Qaeda. What do you do in a war? Well, you kill the other guy. Good, I got it, history. I've seen, I've seen it in the books. What's that look like in this war? Targeted killings outside of internationally agreed theaters of conflict by unmanned aerial vehicles. In a war, you get to capture the enemy and keep him off the battlefield for the duration of the conflict. What's that look like now? Guantanamo. In a war, you get to intercept the enemy's communications. You know, Bletchley Park, Enigma, Purple, Battle of Midway. What's that look like now? Everything Edward Snowden has told you in the past 12 months. We have a national security structure that's hardwired to defend you against powerful nation state actors who will you harm. In the last 13 years, all the friction points, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, how do you balance that? All the friction points are trying to take a security establishment that was hardwired to do this in 1947 and try to make it do this. Let me ask you then, I was going to go to this later, but I'm going to do it now. Uh, you talked about metadata, and <clears throat> there is a question mark uh, in this country at the moment about metadata and its relationship to liberty. Um, people at the NSA and elsewhere have said that the metadata is necessary. Right. It is absolutely necessary. I believe the NSA at one point looked at certain <clears throat> metadata and said there were 50 terrorist plots that were uh, disrupted to some degree by collecting all that data. That's, that's a generous interpretation. It's 54, and it's not just the metadata, it's another program called 702, but okay, okay. so it's useful. You've also heard from people like Senator Wyden and others who you've had a long, contentious and relationship And rich history, with, yes. And rich history, <laughs> uh, who have said that they have looked at the same information that the agencies have looked at and have come to the conclusion that you actually don't need to collect the metadata. Right. I'm assuming you think he is wrong. Why? Well, we have to, we have to parse out our verbs here carefully, all right? Um, the CIA is I can, watching. I can, I can live with not collecting the metadata as long as I can access the metadata. And the grand compromise coming out of the last year, if you've been following this, is NSA will no longer have the phone companies for the metadata their daily program I started on mm -hmm. October. Yes, you did. Early October 2001. We'll simply leave the metadata out there at the companies, but NSA can query the metadata at, at any point, all right? Without a warrant. That's still being debated as to whether or not you need to go to a, a FISA judge right. to get an individualized warrant. But, but keep in mind, what are you getting a warrant for? What is the judge going to look at, okay? Sorry, this stuff gets complicated fast, but what is the metadata used for? So we've got this, we either have access to it or we own it, all right? It's all your phone bills, all right? To, from, when, how long? You roll up a safe house in Yemen, you got pocket litter from the guy that says he's Al-Qaeda, you got a cell phone you've never seen before, and so you go, under this program, you go to that ocean of metadata, and believe me, it's trillions, all right? You go to that ocean of metadata and say, hey, anybody in here talk to this number? 
So what are you going to the court for? You're going to the court to get the court's approval that the phone number you wrote up in Yemen is affiliated with Al-Qaeda. It has nothing to do with you or whether you're under suspicion or anything. The seed number, which is what this is called, that cell phone in, in Yemen, is, is almost always a foreign number picked up by NSA in the course of its foreign intelligence collection. And all NSA wants to know is, has that new Al-Qaeda-related number ever been in contact with a phone number in the United States? Now, if they go, hey, anybody calling this phone number in the Bronx goes, by the way, it's a phone number, it's not a name. The phone number in the Bronx goes, well, yeah, I talk to them every Thursday. NSA then gets to say, well, who the hell do you talk to? And at which point, we are done discussing this program. That's all it does. And then, if that is really interesting, and if what I just said happened, that would be interesting, it's handed over to the FBI to put it in a law enforcement track where all those procedures in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments right. kick in. Oh, back to your question, though. Wyden says it didn't work. Yeah. I, actually, I actually like it, obviously. I started it, all right? Keith Alexander, the current mm -hmm. director until about a month or two ago, liked it and kept it. But then again, we got peculiar backgrounds, right? We, we kind of do this for a living. And that life, liberty, pursuit of happiness thing, we kind of have a special attraction to preserving life. That's our job. That's the job the Republic gave to us. To me, the single greatest proof that the program has utility is the fact that Senator Barack Obama, upon being elected President of the United States, was briefed on the program. And with every stitch of his political body wanting to distance himself between, him, between his administration and the administration of his predecessor said, huh, that's a pretty good idea. I think we ought to keep that one. Let me ask you a separate question. Again, now, now we're, going on a, we're going on a circuitous path here. Uh, but you mentioned cell phones, and you mentioned the cell phone abroad. But I want to ask you actually a question, since we're talking about liberty in this country yeah. to some degree um, in, the, in the next 10 years. You saw the ruling by the Supreme Court last week, yep. week related to cell phones. You bet. If you were a judge on that court, you would have ruled how? If I were an additional judge, it would have been 10-0. Really? Yeah. Hey, I work in foreign intelligence. We're talking about American cell phones. And you don't think, given, given the arguments you've made on everything else, you don't <laughs> believe that there's stuff inside those phones that you would have wanted? Of course there is. But remember, back to the balancing act, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Look, you, you've got to understand, all right? My roots are as a foreign intelligence officer. I am allowed by, by the Constitution and U.S. law to be incredibly more aggressive abroad against the communications of a foreigner right. than, than I am in any way allowed to touch an American communication. Now, in the real world, would my targeting a foreigner bump into communications to, from, or about an American? Oh, geez, yeah. So there are rules for that, all right, and it has to be respected. But fundamentally, I'm going after foreign intelligence information. Right. I'm, I'm up in Vancouver about two years ago, and then the, the flavor of the month we were debating were, was drones. All right? And while I'm in Vancouver in British Columbia, the state of Washington just outlawed drones. All right? They said, no. There were a couple of police departments, local, they had started it. State legislature right. said, put them down. So I'm asked, why, well, suppose you oppose that. And I go, oh, no. I'm, I'm, I totally support that. Well, wait a minute. You, you love drones. Yeah, overseas. Not with regard to American privacy. What do you think is going to happen to American privacy over the next 10 years, given the amount of information, frankly, that we all now provide to the system? Yeah. Whether we're on Facebook, whether <clears throat> we're on Twitter, whether I'm wearing this thing uh, called a jawbone that's telling me how much I sleep and how much I walk, and I assume there'll be a GPS in it soon enough, yeah. and I know there's a GPS in the phone. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing this debate with a larger group down at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Probably would have been last summer. You know, Snowden thing is kind of rolling. Um, with ACLU guy, me, good debate, interesting points. I get all done, I go down, I get in an Uber vehicle, which I'd called, mm -hmm. okay? And then as I get in the Uber, it's about six, six o'clock at night, okay? I get a Groupon email, bing, saying, Knows you, exactly you, you, are. you must be hungry. Here's a coupon, and I can see the restaurant through the windscreen, okay? 
And so the NSA part, I understand why the NSA part is, is kind of juicy because you know, the government possessing stuff is sometimes, sometimes more threatening than, than Eric Schmidt possessing stuff, all right? Um, but this is, a, as I try to suggest, right. this is a far broader question, a question about, about culture and technology of which foreign espionage is, is really just a part. Okay, so, so take the NSA out of it. Yeah. Put the Chinese into it. So here we are providing all this information ourselves to Google and everybody else. Yeah. How much liberty are we ultimately going to have? We're all making choices. We're all probably making uninformed choices. Um, uninformed meaning? Meaning we don't know and we, I, what we're revealing, okay? We are all kind of first generation drivers of these vehicles. And have any of you ever served overseas and been in a country with first generation drivers? It's really dangerous. And so we culturally, we, we, the big we, okay, we as a people, are going to have to decide what that new meaning of privacy is. Um, we had to go up to, to Long Island for Memorial Day weekend to give a Memorial Day speech mm -hmm. up in uh, East Hampton. And so, God, I just love the fact that I had that easy pay thing on the, right. on the windscreen, and I am passing lines on a New Jersey turnpike, and, and you know, anywhere wanting a toll, I am just zipping through. Loved it. Wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for the world. But you realize, okay? There are people I don't know who know exactly where I am and where I have been as I've traveled up 95 and then up the Long Island Expressway. We are constantly making trade-offs of our privacy for convenience, and we're kind of doing it in an uninformed way. Okay, so tell us about the risks. Uh, <sighs> what, what are the real meaningful risks to everyone in this room? Yeah, all right, so, so, so number one, let's talk about Commercial, and risk is not the right word, but, but people who want to sell you stuff are going to know more about you than you want to share. Right. All right? Now, you may find that great when, when Amazon says, how about this book? Right. But you may not find it great in some, in some other circumstances because an awful lot of things that you used to keep in a desk drawer or even in a safe, you're, you're now putting in here, and it, it's being mined. GCHQ is the um, British equivalent of NSA. And one of the Snowden revelations was GCHQ was writing the, the back signal from iPhones uh, that had downloaded Angry Birds. Okay? Now, apparently, Angry Birds sucks out the brains of your iPhone and sends it back to the Angry Birds starship, which I think is in Finland. Okay? Now, GCHQ, the, the British NSA, is going on some of those back channels for legitimate foreign intelligence targets. My God, this is great, all right? But the fundamental moral of the story is not that GCHQ is taking advantage of this against legitimate foreign intelligence targets. The fact of the matter is you downloaded a free app and in return for that, an awful lot of what you keep in here is now available to someone who wants to sell it. Now that that's that's one that's that's commercial one side. Yeah, so that's one danger. Uh, the other danger is there there are foreign intelligence services who are not as good as NSA. All right, we're actually the best in the world at this signals intelligence thing. Still, oh yeah, even after Snowden. Even after Snowden. Yeah, we can talk about that okay. in a few minutes. But if you've got something important there, that's important to them, it's vulnerable. It's you know if you're working for a corporation. Well, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. We have people going to China, all right? They come to us at the Chertoff Group saying, going to China, what kind of precautions must, should I take? Don't take any electronics, is what we tell them. At all? None. If, if, if you're gonna get, you know, kind of twitchy, buy one at the airport, use it while you're in China, and drop it into the bin before you go through customs to leave the country. Is all that right? what you do? Yeah. I, I did a trip to Singapore and Hong Kong and went off the net. And that's not even China proper, right? Uh, when, when President Would Obama- Would you bring a, no laptops then? No. Nothing? No. Now, if you think the Chinese are disinterested in you and feeling lucky, go ahead. <laughs> oh, can I ask a serious question about that? Wait, that was a serious comment. No, no it is, but <laughs> you have to believe they're interested in you. Yeah. Or, How or, interested or are, are they, are they you, broadly? Um, actually, they're voracious. 
and you said, are we still number one? And we are. And who, who else is good at that? Um, British, Australians, Israelis. But you believe they're capturing everybody? Well, or if you're the CEO of a company, yes. Of course. If you're a journalist? Oh, God, yeah. You talk to, you're not important, <laughs> but you talk to important people. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so very much. That'll be the end of the interview. Um, so, wow. Okay. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. All right, so, so Senator Obama is elected president. All right. He ran the campaign from his Blackberry. So we're all watching those TV pictures going, oh, <laughs> this, this isn't going to happen. So we, we, I'm, still, I'm still a director of CIA at the time. So the American security community goes to the president-elect and says, congratulations, Senator, Mr. President-elect, but um, you, you can't do that BlackBerry thing while, okay? And he actually said on CNBC that um, they will have to pry it from my fingers. I really didn't expect a Second Amendment-like bumper sticker coming out of the president-elect. <laughs> but so we said, "All right, you're going to be president. You get to keep it, but could we borrow it for a day or two? So we did. We did a few adjustments. Now, what's the subplot of what I just told you? Subplot of what I just told you is the soon-to-be most powerful man in the most powerful country on this planet, in his national capital, was going to have his emails his text messages, and his phone calls, intercepted and listened to by almost countless foreign intelligence services. And we didn't, we didn't rend our garments. We didn't claim moral high ground. We didn't pretend outrage. We just said that's the way it is. So what did you do to the phone? I can't say that. <laughs> um, when you think about <clears throat> liberty, the other word that comes to mind often is democracy. Yeah. When you were on Fox this morning talking about Iraq. What, is the, what, is the, what does democracy look like to you over the next 10 years, not just here, but around the world? Yeah. On, uh, number one, this thing is our gateway to perhaps the most democratizing uh, technical advance probably since Gutenberg, all right? So, so there, are, there are reasons to be hopeful because we now have a, a single integrated ubiquitous, common, accessible information grid around the world. Now, that may not last. There are forces of darkness against that. But, but right now, that, that has got to be kind of chalked up to a, a real plus. You don't get the Arab awakening w without Facebook and, and Twitter and, frankly, Al Jazeera, right? I mean, that, that, it just doesn't happen with that. So it, it, it's a destabilizing thing, but it also, it also underpins human power and the explosion and, and the use of, of human potential in a way we haven't seen changed in, in centuries. Now, that's happening in a society, and I'm just going to focus on the Arab world because mm -hmm. you said globally, but let's, mm -hmm. let's just use the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. That's happening in a society that has traditionally have a far, has a far more transcendental view of the creator than we in Christianity, Christianity have had since probably the Thirty Years' War in the 16, uh, 1600s. And so for, for many parts of Islam to put human will between the will of God and human beings is in itself sacrilegious. Okay. So I don't think they're going to follow the precise American model that was drawn up because, because of a far different intellectual tradition. But what one can hope for, I think, and, and reasonably hope for in, in, in that part of the world, which I, I, I am just kind of suggesting is going to be problematic for democracy right. as we know it, um, what we can reasonably hope for are more transparent, more responsive, more responsible, more inclusive governments, which is really what I hit Maliki about this morning on Fox. I mean, he is he's an exclusive leader. Right? He's not particularly efficient, but he's frozen out the Kurds and the Sunnis from the government. I want to go to the transparency issue for, for a moment, because I have also heard you argue the flip side. I have, urged, I have heard you argue the point that in a post-Edward Snowden world, actually the internet doesn't become more expansive and more transparent, but actually becomes closed. Yeah. Here's, here's the dark side. And I'll, I'll, 
it's a long, longish story, but I'll be very efficient. Um, there are entities out there, I just mentioned some, all right, um, who actually oppose the World Wide Web, are, are fretting about it, not, not for the reasons we fret about it, like somebody's stealing my credit card number or somebody's stealing my intellectual property. They, they are opposed to the web because of its very nature, because it allows the free flow of information. And so there was a meeting in Dubai in um, December of 2012 by something called the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. It's the oldest functioning body under the UN. It goes back to the 19th century. And there was a strong move by the Russians, the Chinese, the Saudis, the Iranians, and like-minded states to wrest control of the internet from the coalition of the willing that we've constructed with admittedly very powerful American influence and drop it in the UN where then these individual states would have a much stronger say on how the internet is governed. Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen wrote a book two or three years ago called The New Digital Age in which they were worried about this. American military guys talk about cyber as a domain. We go land, sea, airspace, cyber. And what Jared and Eric wrote in their book was that these countries who are not opposed to the internet for the security reasons you and I might fret about, but because of its very nature, will try to impose on this new domain the kind of physical barriers we have been accustomed to down here in these domains, territoriality, sovereign space, and so on. Right? And so they predicted, for example, that, that we could very well see in the near future something equating to a digital passports and digital visas to be required. What do I mean by that? And I, I don't mean going online so you can go to Australia, all right? I mean that you don't get to get into .ch without the permission of the Chinese government. And more importantly, you don't get to leave .ch without the permission of the Chinese government. And so, in other words, what you get is the balkanization of the right. internet to, and, you, and well, wait, one more point. Yeah. And if you think that's fanciful, we've already begun to see the effects of it with what I would call, and they call, digital residency requirements. A lot of states, Brazil, Germany, demanding that web service providers, which are inherently ungeographic, that web service providers must keep their data on servers in that nation's sovereign space. The Snowden stuff is going to put wind in the sails of the Chinese and the Russians because they will then say, these Americans weren't interested in free speech at all. These Americans wanted to keep the internet the way it was so they can do that espionage stuff. These guys meet again in Pusan in October. But we could see, you know, did you like the internet? It was a nice <laughs> Might thing. be the question, yeah. But that may really be the question in our lifetimes. Handicap this, though. In the, in the steady <clears throat> march of, of technological progress, I would make the argument to you, even if the Chinese or the Germans or whomever decided they wanted to have this sort of very siloed world, that the peer-to-peer -peer nature of computing and progress, and I think of what's going on in Iraq, I think it's called FireEye or Fire, mm -hmm. Fire Chat is, is a new peer-to-peer, -peer, yeah. almost like a Twitter kind of thing yeah. that people are using uh, that's not even connected. Right. Won't, I, won't, won't I, there be no wall, ultimately? I, won't there be? No walls. I, I hope you're right. All right, I would like to think you're right. I think this thing we're talking about here, the World Wide Web, again, uh, the most dramatic advance in, in, in our species history since centuries ago, and I'd like to keep it the way it is, you know, unitary, global, ubiquitous, accessible, identical, and so on. And, and, and I hope technology allows us to do that. But at the policy level, these states are pushing very hard. By the way, those of you who follow this, if you notice, we're, we're volunteering to give up ICANN early, okay? That's, in my mind, that's dangerous, but I think it's a clever move. That's a backfire. And, like, and treat this as, a, as a, a forest ablaze. This is our willingness to give up ICANN to trusted third parties. Explain what, for, for those who are yeah. unfamiliar with it's ICANN. A, it's, it's the organization, largely American, that assigns internet names right. and numbers. All right, so it, it, it creates the domains in, on the internet. We've done it, we've actually done a very good job. We, we, have, we, we have been very benevolent in how we've governed the, 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 the internet. But I understand, we, we're not gonna do this forever. It's gotta be more internationalized. 
We've got this move by ITU to internationalize it in this very dark way. We then stepped up and said, why don't we shed ICANN earlier than we had anticipated and give it to this other group over which we might have more control. And again, my metaphor is that's a forest fire. This is our backfire against that forest fire to try to prevent the worst ramifications of change. What is the, and you mentioned it, but I don't think we, we got actually got, got to the risk. What do you consider the greatest risk for, to our liberty right now? Wow. Some of the things we've talked about earlier here today, about the meaningfulness of democracy, about the participation in democracy, about translating um, important issues to, to the public in ways in which they, they can, they can debate them and understand them in an adult sort of way. I mean, let me default to the current discussion, all right? Um, this Snowden thing, from my point of view, has been incredibly ugly for lots of reasons. One of the big reasons, apropos your question, is the debate about it here has not been fact-based. Um, we have created, uh, much of the debate has, has taken on the characteristics of a mob, a false sense of urgency, misinformation, and, and, and moving to judgment prior to getting a, a true understanding of all the facts. I'll bet you there are folks out there who wonder why we didn't get those Tsarnaev kids in Boston because they were surfing to jihadist websites. After all, you guys watch that all the time. And I'll bet you there are people out there who think NSA actually intercepts your emails. And I'll bet you there are folks out there who think NSA targets your phone calls. I mean, none of those things are true. But the national debate isn't in that place. I mean, look, the best I usually get from audiences is something like, hey, I don't mind if you're listening to my calls. And I go, whoa, no, we're not doing that. I don't want that vote. That's a bad vote. Okay? We are not doing that. We wouldn't do that. And so a threat to democracy is the quality of our participation in national decision making. Is there anything that go good that came out of the Snowden revelations? No. <laughs> no part of this debate would you suggest has been helpful? Uh, he accelerated what was an inevitable debate because of the things I mm -hmm. said, you, the cultural change, right. the technological change, change in the character of the enemy or the threat. All right? He accelerated it, but any credit he gets for accelerating it, playing back to what I just said now, is taken away by the fact that he badly misshaped it. Is there a way to be transparent and yet also safeguard our security? Or are, are there, those two uh, no. ideas completely at odds? No, no. In fact, I, I've, been, I've been quite public about this. That, that, look, on a narrowly defined professional basis, I mean, you know, CIA head, NSA head, narrowly defined professional basis, I don't want to tell you anything. All right? Because the word getting out about how we do espionage, you know, espionage is your best done in secret, right? Okay, good. All right. Because public knowledge of how we conduct espionage shaves points off of effectiveness, all right? But as an American, not as the CIA guy, but as an American, that dog's never going to hunt, all right? We live in a democracy. I've got to have your permission, or at least your under broad understanding of what it is we do. Otherwise, you quite legitimately are going to take the hall pass away from me, right? And so, I have called for greater transparency in American espionage so as to get your endorsement for what it is we are doing in your name and on your behalf. And now there's, there's one important footnote to this. By the way, I support that. Otherwise, you're just going to take the toys away from me and we're not going to do any of it. So we've got to be more transparent. That's my concession. Your concession is to the degree we are more transparent to you, to that degree almost precisely, we will be less effective because we will be giving up information about sources and methods. What do, to what degree, if you could measure it, mm -hmm. do you think we will be less effective in a post-Snowden world? Yeah. Has this been around the margins? Is it 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 50%? What are we talking about? Well, there's lots of ways of coming at the issue. I'm, I'm going to kind of do it a little anecdotally first and then maybe kind of mm -hmm. do a, an estimate. Um, 
I can't imagine how much energy I would expend, how many people I would try to suborn, how, how many communications I would try to intercept in order to know the detailed information of the intelligence budget of any nation around the world who even potentially could do you harm. In the name of transparency, the CBJB, the Congressional Budget Justification Book mm -hmm. of the American Intelligence Community is available on the World Wide Web. Right? Don't tell me that's not without cost. Every other country in the world protects that at, at, at the highest levels. Now, we talked earlier today over lunch right. that all advantage in espionage is trans, transient. All right? you, you never get to a place and say, okay, I'm good, we're good to go, it's, it's the way it's going to be. It's, it, it all changes. All right? And so if you have, an, and by the way, in signals intelligence, the, the, the advantage is really transient. Signals intelligence, the stuff Snowden's releasing, is, is far more brittle than any other sources of intelligence, whether it be open source or human sources or imagery sources and so on. Signals intelligence is, is far more fragile because let me, let me show you the action required to close off a signals intelligence source. Okay? You would have spent billions of dollars in order to access a particular frequency and it goes away with that action. All right? And so this is always transitory. What Snowden did was to take your countries, not NSA's, your country's current advantage and slap it back here, maybe here. We're good at this. We'll recover it. All right? But in the meantime, there will be a lot of communications out there that will not be covered. So there will just be this gap for, for an extended period of time. And because of the nature of what he revealed, I mean, he didn't reveal that we know that secret. He revealed how it is we know that secret. You know, we talk about leaks, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I asked, how bad was the leak? Was it a bucket? Was it a cup? Was it a barrel? Snowden's leaks aren't buckets and cups and barrels. Snowden's leaks the plumbing. Snowden has leaked how we get the stuff. And so we'll recover, but there'll be a gap. It'll take time, and it'll be expensive. All right? So that's, that's my most realistic assessment. Of, of the damage that he's done. Okay, I want to open the conversation up to the audience. Before I do that, I have one final question. I, before I, I sat down here, I tweeted out that we would be seeing uh, Michael Hayden, and, and, and I said, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, literally, I think 10 of the questions, same question was asked, uh, which is, is it possible that the NSA has Lois Lerner's uh, email? <laughs> I thought I'd get a laugh, but I didn't even get a laugh, so there. <laughs> here, the unimportant person asked me the important person questions. I don't know, but I'll ask around. <laughs> You'll ask around. Okay, why don't we open up for questions uh, in the audience. We have uh, a hand right here in the front. Um, when you talk about the rules that constrain the national security state, whether it's the NSA or the CIA, part of the reason the public um, has less confidence in those rules than it might, uh, I think, is that we very seldom see people who break those rules be prosecuted uh, and go to jail. Like in any organization, people do sometimes break the rules, of course. It's not to say the whole organization is bad. So in what circumstances do you think that national security <coughs> officials who do break the rules, even with the best of intentions, ought to be prosecuted and go to jail for it, like people who break rules who are not national security officials? Yeah, I mean, laws are laws. And the laws that govern NSA are not, they're not civil statutes. They're criminal statutes. All right? So NSA takes this very, very seriously. Now, not all violations of laws are intentional. Not all violations of the law actually, actually constitute a crime. Right? And so you've got you to keep those things, those things in mind. Um, when I was director, there were several instances of employees overseas um, attempting to monitor the conversations of, how do I put this? people with whom they were formerly intimate, <laughs> okay? Uh, girlfriends, boyfriends, and so on. Um, when discovered, you know, disciplinary action was, was meted out to all of them. Um, we forwarded all the cases to the Department of Justice for potential prosecution. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many actually were prosecuted, may, may, maybe zero. Um, they were all dismissed. Uh, all the people were dismissed, uh, lost their clearance, 
things like that. Um, what, what, what specific crimes do you have in mind that weren't prosecuted? Well, uh, in one case, you know, there was legislation that retroactively gave the telecoms immunity. Um, so that seems like a clear case of w what reason could there be for doing that unless a law was broken and we don't want these people prosecuted. No, it wasn't prosecution. It was civil suits. Uh, punished then. And, uh, you know, e everything from... But there's a difference. Sh sure, but, but again, um, the difference is some kind, of, um, some kind of consequences for breaking the rules, right? Um, whether it's civil, whether it's criminal, uh, if there are no consequences, it seems like the rules... But, but, I, but I have, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't answer this in the abstract. Okay, the, so, ab the abstract answer is do the crime, do the time. Now, sure. what specific crime do you have in mind? Uh, so take torture, for example. Uh, no, no one at the high level was prosecuted for right. torture. Right. Uh, there were a few low-level people. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. There's a contractor in North Carolina who was prosecuted... Mm -hmm. for beating a detainee with a flashlight. Um, why do you call what CIA did torture? Uh, because I think it falls under the international definition of it. Three out of the last four attorneys general said, said it didn't. And the fourth one who said it did, said it did before he'd been briefed on what was being done. Well, I guess we could have a long argument. But it, no, it, facts, facts are really stubborn. Well, we haven't seen the CIA Senate torture report because it's being suppressed by the CIA. No, it's not being suppressed. It's being redacted for security information. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, why don't we take another question? Sarah in the red. In, in the, we'll take you guys for lunch. Yes, the, I think two years ago, it was reported in the technical press, Aviation Week and all, that the Chinese had... Um, infiltrated the um, communication systems between um, the, uh, the contractors making the F-35. And um, well, I guess they had general conferences and everything, and decision making by means of uh, internet or whatever they yeah. were using. And uh, I guess, <clears throat> and it, it's reported, uh, at least by Aviation Week, that uh, the damage done was uh, in terms of uh, billions of dollars, I think millions of lines of code or had to be redone or something, and actually delay of the F-35 program uh, by maybe years. Uh, I guess, uh, are we still vulnerable to that? At, yeah. And are, uh, or <clears throat> have there been effective means of uh, uh, pr protecting ourselves? I'm asking how safe are we from that yeah. Or do we really just need to have face-to-face -face meetings and secure buildings and not do their design yeah. and every other darn thing over the internet? Yeah, the, the, the Chinese are very active, very aggressive. They're really good at this. Um, uh, not as good as us, but they make up for what they lack in elegance with mass. All right, they, they're just very persistent. Uh, as a professional, uh, I've said publicly, I stand back in awe at the depth, breadth, persistence of the Chinese espionage effort against the United States of America. As a professional, it's just a thing to behold. Um, they did penetrate the defense contractors for the F-35. I don't know the specifics, but uh, your numbers sound about right in terms of the harm that was done. That's international espionage. Um, steal those secrets, shame on us, not shame on China. All right, We should protect our information better. We're getting better at it, but it is hard to do. Y you know, the internet. I mean, we did it, right? I met the guy who invented it, uh, Vin Cerf, out at Stanford. And Vin will tell you, hey, we, we, didn't, we didn't build defenses into this thing. We were told to build a, a network that allowed us to move large volumes of data quickly and easy, easily between a limited number of nodes, all of whom I know and all of whom I trust. It's a couple of universities and a bunch of federal labs. Okay? He actually says, I had no idea it was going to take off. <laughs> and, and now it's out there, but the architecture is still the same. The architecture is presumed trust. I played offense okay, at, at NSA, in defense, but I played offense. This was easy. We went out there and stole a whole bunch of other country's secrets because of the nature of the World Wide Web. Well, guess what? They're doing the same. And now it's up to us to better defend ourselves. 
Again, this is not something about moral outrage. This is what, this is what adult nations do to one another. This, this is an R-rated movie. This happens all the time. This is an accepted international practice. Now, what is not an accepted international practice is that China doesn't go after Northrop Grumman on the F-35. I'd do that. They go after International Harvester for their designs. Why? Because International Harvester is making a missile? No. They want to copy the designs and build the agriculture equipment to undersell the Americans. All right. That's different. All right. We steal stuff to keep you safe and free. The Chinese steal stuff to make their citizens rich. That's a very different formula. But the F-35 thing, that would have been in our box, too. How much information sharing should take place between business and the government? Far, and, who, and who should be responsible? Far more than what's going on. Um, I just kind of gave you the backstory on the internet, and, and we're talking about F-35 theft. An awful lot of American cyber power at the government level has come out of my old community, the intelligence community. I mean, Cyber Command is at Fort Meade because it's integrated with the National Security Agency. My community is really hinky about secrecy. All right, we don't, we just naturally keep things too closed. And so we have not been generous enough in sharing cyber threat information between the government and private industry and, and vice versa. We have got to get far better at that Otherwise, we're going to continue to experience what Northrop right. Grumman experienced. I imagine that creates its own risks. But let's take a couple other questions yeah. from the audience. Sir. Uh, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm very interested to hear your outlook or estimation of our advantage in outer space, not just cyberspace, oh. at a time when we're rolling back elements of our, uh, of our space program yeah. and, and there's a proliferation of countries able to launch satellites. Yeah. Uh, a, a, couple, a couple of thoughts, and all of them peripheral. I, this, is, this is not something that, that I, I, I've really studied, have much background in. Um, th there's a natural erosion of our advantage in space. I mean, getting to space was really hard. We got there. One other big nation state got there. We were better than they were with what we put up there, but there were only two up there. But I mean, it was inevitable. That, that other nations would begin to, to take advantage of that, that domain, all right? And so I mean, it, some, some of this is just a force of nature. I'm old enough to remember when taking pictures from space was so hard to do that there were only two countries who could do it and only one who could do it well. And right now, if any of you ever mind, you get back to your room after this, you can take your iPad and surf the web and look at current or near current imagery of Taepodong, North Korea, in sufficient resolution to know whether the North Koreans are stacking a missile at Taepodong. I mean, that's, that's what's happened. So we had a peculiar advantage, because we were there first, but it wasn't a lasting advantage. We knew that. The other, the other element I'd, I'd share with you is that our, our investment in it as, 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 a, as a nation has actually atrophied. So now you've got the whole uh, Elon Musk and rocket engines, and we got to buy our engines from the Russians, and what do we need to preserve as an inherent American industrial base for going to space? Because right now, we're relying on the Russians for our rocket engines. Let's sneak in a couple more questions right here in the middle. Many years ago, the Russians stole the let's, let's get your microphone. Many years ago, the Soviets stole the uh, design of the B-29 to be able to build a uh, plane big enough to carry an atomic bomb because they, their bombs were big. Yeah. Is there a modern, is there a current example of another country stealing <clears throat> enough information on one of our weapons to reproduce it as well as the Soviets did? The, um, what's changed is when, when the Russians, and you're right, they stole the designs of the B-29 and built an aircraft called the Tupolev-4. All right? Yeah, down to the rivet, it was a copy. But that was in the industrial age, and they were industrial power. And so once you got the designs, you had the industrial base to go do it. Okay. Now the Chinese get F-35 data, but the F-35 is designed to be stealthy in addition to, to other things. It is much more difficult for another country 
even with the design, to mirror the stealthiness of an F-35 because that depends on industrial processes, techniques, fabrication, and other materials that they don't have yet present in their industrial base. And so, although that happened then, it still happens now, the immediate impact is not as great. Uh, Bob Gates is SecDef, went to visit China. He's talking to the Chinese president the day the Chinese flew what our press called a stealth fighter, mm -hmm. right? Well, it looked like an F-22, all right? I'm pretty convinced it wasn't stealthy because that depends on industrial techniques and so on that you have to develop. You just can't steal. I'd like to just ask a follow-up. You mentioned International Harvester. It happened that I was the chief technical officer of International <laughs> Harvester. And uh, the same question applies to today in stealing not military equipment, but commercial equipment, right. the design of the iPhone 5. Right. Have they been successful doing that? I, I, I don't. I, it, doesn't, I, it, it, it doesn't look like it because yeah. there's no country building a product that has the features that are unique to the designs of American commercial products. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just don't have the background answer. Sorry, I don't know. Let's sneak in one or two more questions before we uh, have to close things down. Go ahead, sir. How is it that uh, Edward Snowden had access to such a massive amount of highly sensitive information? And what are we doing right now to make sure that doesn't happen again? Isn't our time up? <laughs> <laughs> There, there, there is no explaining it, all right? The phrase I used earlier, shame on us. This should have never happened, all right? Now, let's talk about the facts of the case, the specifics. Uh, after 9-11, the American intelligence community, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, was beaten up pretty severely for not connecting the dots, for information staying in silos. Back to an earlier question. Mm -hmm. FBI law enforcement data over here, NSA foreign intelligence data over here. If they'd have been more quickly melded, Zacharias Massawi may have, his computer may have, I mean, you, you get the picture, right? And so we've spent more than a decade um, trying to increase our ability to share information, okay? Um, we, we used to go, we used to have a philosophy with regard to information that, that actually was labeled need to know. And it evolved after 9-11 into responsibility to share. And so we, we built systems that allowed as much information as possible to be shared as easily as possible with as many people as possible. And Edward Snowden was a SharePoint administrator. It was his job to tee up information so that it could be shared laterally so, so his gathering that data on one level was about as suspicious as a librarian being seen with books, okay? Now, after Bradley Manning, and he was on a Department of Defense network and downloaded hundreds of thousands of documents, all right? Again, should he have had access to State Department embassy cables? God, no. But remember, responsibility to share. So he downloaded all of them, gave them to WikiLeaks, and they were published. Uh, we then began, at the direction of the president, to build network monitoring software into classified networks. I mean, you know, who among us have not gotten the phone call from our credit card company saying, are you in Nigeria? And when you say no, they say, well, your credit card is. <laughs> and it, it's just almost within minutes of the event. So it's that kind of thing. Um, that network, the Overwatch thing, was deployed, but not nearly at the rate it should have been deployed. The last aspect of NSANet that was to get the upgrade was Oahu, was NSA Hawaii. Um, I think you make a fair case that he was smart enough that he knew that. And that's why he left the job he had at Dell to go to the job at Booz Allen on Oahu so that he could access this kind of information. So back to your original quote and right. Snowden, this is not an innocent who was shocked by what he found. This was not a gatherer. He was a hunter. He went in there with, with that purpose. But back to the first 
statement. There's no explaining it. That's, we, we did bad. Let's take one final question. I think there was a hand right up this way. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Oh, is there, no. there's two hands? I didn't. I'll be, I'll be quick. <laughs> Go for both. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I wonder if you could comment on the risk of a presidential abuse of the powers that you have. Yep, um, and, and that, that's really the problem, isn't it? Your other question, what's the risk of, the, of a presidential abuse of the powers that you have? And that is really the issue. I mean, it really is. And look, we all went to the same high school. We all, we all, say, we all share the same political cultural values. I'm as concerned about executive overreach as anybody in this room, all right? I really am. And so the danger of the metadata database being held at NSA is that someone, somewhere in the future, no record of any abuse, all right? Everyone who's looked at it said, nope, they've done it. You may not like the idea, but they've done it just the way they said they were going to go do it. So, so I, understand, I understand that concern. And so the compromise now that, all right, NSA can access the data, but it doesn't own it, is, you know, even at the operational level, all right, that's a little more cumbersome, but if that's, if that's what the password is, good. We'll, we'll, go ahead, we'll go ahead and do that. President Obama, when he made the speech, was really, really quite interesting. His speech on this, he, first third was about, it's a dangerous world, we've got to do this, which was really good. Second third was about domestic, third third was about foreign. On the domestic part, if you, if you just melt the speech down to its core essence, what he said was, what we've been doing is lawful, what we've been doing is appropriate. What we've been doing is effective. There has been no abuse of what we've been doing. But I know you're nervous, so I'm going to change a bunch of stuff. And that, that, is, that is not an unfair summary of the middle third of President Obama's speech. I don't mean to make light, light of that. In a democracy, when the citizenry is nervous, that's a big deal. And so I, I understand I'm totally accepting of no access to the data or no, no, no possession of the data, just access to the data. Let's leave the conversation there. Mike Hayden, thank you very, very Thanks. much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your questions.